Hey everybody, welcome to the 10% True Podcast. Quick message from me before you get stuck in. This podcast is free, so there's no advertising. I don't monetize it on YouTube. You don't have to sit through any annoying adverts, and I don't even ask for any money through Patreon. But if you could, in exchange for that, drop me a like, leave a comment, share my content, and if you're listening to the podcast version, maybe leave a review of the channel, that would be hugely appreciated. It will help me to grow my audience, which is really what I'm trying to achieve. Anyway, with that, I'll let you get back to listening. Enjoy. Sly, welcome back to Tim Century. Oh, thanks, Steve. Uh, good to see you again. We uh, we had a, a fantastic conversation last time around. Uh, this is part two, so anybody joining on the podcast, um, and you haven't if you haven't listened to part one, go back and find that uh, before you listen to this. But talked uh, about your early career, um, Sly flying um, fighters in the Marine Corps, and got to the point where uh, you were about to go off and do an exchange on on the F fifteen, but. Before we explore that, what I'd really be keen to do is understand a little bit about your time at Top Gun and, and WTI. Um, so when you, when we talked last time, you described Top Gun as a sort of finishing school, uh, and I wondered if you could explain more about that. You know, in what way was it a, a finishing school? Well, uh, well, of course, it's a very advanced level of flying that you don't normally get to do. Uh, in a fleet squadron, um, depending on the currency and the experience of your fleet squadron, uh, there's certain level of flights. I can go one through 400, a 400 series flight is a fairly sophisticated flight. At least that's how they named it back then. Um, Top Gun was a 400 plus, uh, 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 series because you not only had to perform, but now you had to be able to instruct. So you can go back to your fleet squadron and help the pilots, assist them in learning the latest tactics and the late, latest way to employ uh, the F-18, which uh, was a challenge. Uh, a lot of guys that were in the airplane liked to fly it like they did in the A-4. You know, it's just an A-4 with afterburner. Or and, and I'm not saying that disparagingly. I'm just saying you know what you know. And so if you have folks coming in from, you know, the F-4, which is a great airplane, great American war machine, um, but those tactics aren't the same that you would fly in the Hornet. So you, you, so Top Gun not only taught you how to be an instructor, they taught, they taught you how to be an effective instructor. So you could actually get people to want to learn how to fly new tactics and employ that airplane as best you can. So that's why I said it's more of a finishing school because we had gone from uh, my uh, with Manfred Reach as our squadron commander. We uh, flew over 300 hours a year, went to multiple red flags, did multiple high level series flying because the squadron was so experienced. They just dragged me along with them. Uh, and I learned a lot from that, that squadron, an extraordinary group of people. And uh, so Top Gun was just that was uh, finishing school probably isn't right. It's it's um, but they taught you how to best employ your aircraft in the air to air mode, especially or primarily, uh, and then be able to recant what you did in the air in a one v one, two v x, four v x, four v four, or uh, and we did some strikes. Now you had to stand up in front of the crowd and debrief that. And Top Gun had these things called murder boards. Very, they murder board each other um, so that when you give a brief, you're not waving your hands all over the place. You're not distracting. You're very clear, concise, and you have some great recall on what just happened. So that recall is important. It used to be any the first one to get to the whiteboard wins, you know, then recanting an air to air engagement. Um, we got better uh, with that, and but and top, but you, you just as we talked about before, one v one BFM has all kinds of intricacies, and if you want to be able to teach the person that you just went up against on how to best employ, you need to show them not just through your HUD tape, but on the board and have a recollection of what you did 
you know, two hours ago, because by the time you get back into, you know, gas, uh, stop, put gas in the airplane, walk up to debrief, um, it could be up to two hours. So now you've got to recall a really dynamic situation that you did two hours ago. It's not as it's not. And I know two hours doesn't sound like much, but a lot happens in there because by the time you're walking a debrief, someone's hitting you up for, you know, if you're a ramp, if you're a, in the Marine Corps, if you're a line officer, hey, uh, hey, Sly, we got um, we got, you know, private Schmuckatelli's going to office hours here. OK, I'll be there in a minute. You know, as you're going to your debrief, you know, you've got to keep focused on debriefing what you just did and being able to remember it and compartmentalize what you did. And the Top Gun was really good at that. They really helped you um, be a good instructor. And I think that was the key. There were no secrets that, you know, they were all extraordinary aviators, the Top Gun instructors, and they really wanted to see you excel. And uh, so nothing was held back, it, no secrets. They really just gave you the best skill set they thought to get you back out in the fleet and be the instructor that they want you to be. Brief, briefly then, Sly, what, what is the trick, um, if that's not the wrong word to use, for being able to take part in one of those very dynamic, very intricate um, engagements and then remember, accurately yeah. remember? Well, they'll, they'll teach you, it's almost like um, shorthand uh, on your uh, knee board, you'll have a, a sheet of paper or a briefing card uh, that has a, a nice blank space on it. If I were, if I was doing BFM, I'd probably carry three of those. And, you know, you would, uh, you would uh, just start how you know, write down how the fight started, a couple dynamic maneuvers, and then you'd back it up with your HUD. But the, the, the graphics were, you know, um, you know, uh, if you're going two circle fight, then you would write, you'd write down two circle, you would do like a figure eight uh, on your map. And then if you're going single circle and then going up in the vertical, uh, there is, there are graphics for that, and they were just little squiggly lines with an arrow going up and coming down or a circle. And you would do that to refresh your memory. And then you would back it up with your HUD tape, uh, in case your memory wasn't as good as you had hoped. Mm -hmm. It is, it took some time. Um, because if you didn't write anything down, then you wouldn't remember your first engagement. It's like going, you know, house shopping, you see four houses, you don't remember the first one. So it's uh, if you don't write down something um, to a, a, a point, a conclusive point in the engagement, uh, you, you won't remember it. I mean, it's just so they Top Gun helped you with that. But the fleet also did that. I mean, we all practiced that before we got the Top Gun. Um, but they really helped you polish that so that you could recant three BFM engagements um, uh, with some with some some degree of accuracy uh, backed up with your HUD. Was there a strong technical emphasis as well in terms of understanding how your systems worked, understanding how radar, um, radar warning missiles, avionics, how, how all those things worked as well? Well, most folks that go to Top Gun have a lot of time in the airplane already. So that is the that's a given that you understand how to employ your aircraft at the highest level that the squadron has you at. So, no, I don't think there was a big, I mean, there were classes, uh, um, but none of those, there were great, no great eye openers in the academic part of Top Gun, at least again, 35 years ago. Um, yeah, I had a lot of time in the airplane, so uh, I was very fortunate. And, and WTI then, that's the Marine Corps, uh, Weapons Tactics Instructor? Weapon Tactics Instruct Instructors course taught out in Yuma. It's uh, uh, MOTS 1, WA, uh, or MAWTS, MOTS, Marine Air Weapons Training. And um, that is a, uh, that's more of the Marine Air Ground Task Force. It's, it's more combined arms. Uh, heavily aimed towards supporting the troops and uh, surface missions. So some um, Top Gun pure air to air with, I think we did one or two strikes, graduation strikes. Um, and the uh, MOTS one was heavy academics 
and uh, uh, 85% uh, ordnance delivery and ground tactics, air to ground tactics, working with the entire Marine Air Group. Um, so you're incorporating uh, rotary air, you're learning how to fight against a helicopter, which you might think is, you know, that'd be easy, but a helicopter's, uh, you know, some ordnance won't arm on something flying that slow. Or you may not, you know, you fly by and they've got gunners in the doors and they can actually shoot at you. So you did things that you've never done before, like BFM with a helicopter. But, um, you know, so, um, but it was more focused, completely focused on uh, the, uh, the combined arms uh, work. So it was a tough school, very tough school. I mean, what, we had one briefing where the wing command, and I know this, he's now a retired three star. Uh, we gave up and gave the two hour brief and he goes, we're not flying this mission today. Go back and do your homework. He went, wow. Sent the entire, you know, it's an auditorium full of aviators ready to go fly. Uh, he did not care for the, uh, the brief. It was not, it was not to his liking, which he was the Colonel at the time ahead of Mots one. He just says, go back to your rooms. We'll see you in 12 hours, 12 or 24 hours. Get this right. Cause this isn't good. We're not wasting assets on this mission. So it was tough. It was, uh, it, they were, it was a tough course. I was going to ask you, I mean, obviously the, the uh, sort of highlight, if it's not disrespectful to say it, but the highlight of this conversation, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully be talking about your uh, your 17th of January uh, MiG-29 kill. But uh, I was going to ask at that point, but let's bring it forward a little bit about the importance of feeling ordnance come off the aeroplane. So dropping bombs is, is one thing, but were you also shooting missiles? Did you know what sensations, sounds, delays there would be between hitting the pickle button and the weapon coming off the aeroplane? Yeah, um, we did a lot of bombing uh, at Moss, but we'd done so much before in the squadron I was in. Um, I, you know, I talk about we were mostly air to air, but we did a lot of orders. I got to do everything, got to shoot missiles, uh, shot an AIM-7. Um, so there were no surprises. Uh, maybe uh, we did night bombing under flares. That was colorful never done that before we shot zuni rockets at night which is interesting just you know you don't want to stare at the flames going out it kind of gives you a little bit of night blindness but uh, so we did some things that we hadn't done in the fleet but generally most of the stuff was um uh just high level fleet uh training so no no big surprises we carried 2000 pound bombs all the time and there's no big jolt didn't no surprises on that, and, and just briefly, because I, I, you know, we we've got a finite amount of time, and I want to I want to talk about the eagle. Well, yeah, sure. hopefully both want to talk about the eagle, but the, the Hornet then, um, and putting things like two thousand pound bombs on it, and and maybe sort of taking that to an extreme, and then having an asymmetry where you've maybe dropped one two thousand pounder off one wing, now you've got another two thousand pounder on the other, and, and it's two thousand pounds heavier that wing, and now you start pulling three, four, six G, whatever it is. How, how well did that aeroplane then uh, cope with? those sorts of symmetries or, or sort of demanding configurations? I think as long as you kept your airspeed up, I didn't think it was a problem at all. And generally, if you were going to get rid of one, you're going to get rid of the other one pretty quickly. You know, so you weren't, you weren't doing BFM with a 2000 pound bomb on, on one side. I mean, that the airplane's made for it. Honestly, if I was going to go into uh, a, a real engagement in real life with uh, one 2,000 pound bomb. It, I would uh, jettison that sucker before I engaged any kind of enemy aircraft. Yeah. But that's just me. I mean, that's what I would have done. You explained then in the in our last interview how you thought the um, initial orders to go and report to Eglin and fly the Eagle were a, a hoax um, based on your the shenanigans yeah. you, you guys yeah. and the, the other Joes have been up to. But so, so can you talk us through then the well, maybe let's 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 discuss what the purpose of an exchange tour is. Why why would a marine go and fly a, an eagle with the air force? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you the impetus uh, to wa wanting to go fly the F fifteen is I would take the, uh, this brand new Hornet and go to air shows, and all these little kids would ask me, "Have you ever flown the F 15 I go, "No, never flown the. This is an F eighteen. It's brand new. It's really nice. It, look how cool it is." Yeah, but have you ever flown the F-15? So when the exchange tour became available and I was in Korea, I put in for it because uh, I want. And plus, you know, I, I had my time with Eagle drivers um, at Red Flag. 
Um, they were killing us all. And uh, it was very frustrating. Wasn't a huge Eagle driver fan uh, as a fighter attack guy. I don't think many are. Um, it's, it's a different group of folks. Uh, they're not bad, but they sure they can be arrogant. Um, and uh, um, I said, well, I'm just going to go see what this thing's all about. So that's the, and so the exchange tour, essentially the purpose though, is to take uh, an aviator from another service and teach them the tactics that they use. And maybe you can teach them some of the tactics uh, that you've employed uh, in your time in your air, air, aircraft. So uh, as an example, we had a, an F-15 exchange pilot, the Navy did, uh, and he went to the aircraft carrier, which not many Air Force guys get to go land on a boat. So um, you get to see exactly what goes on in an aircraft carrier, which is staggering when you think about they still have to go fly airplanes and do a mission. I mean, and I'm sure you've talked to plenty of naval aviators. That is a, a whole new ball game compared to landing on a 10,000 foot runway. I digress, I guess, but the whole idea, Steve, is just to take, um, learn their tactics and how they employ their airplane. And hopefully you can give them some of your ideas because maybe they don't understand um, in an air superior role, maybe they don't understand a bar cap or, uh, you know, a, a different things that they might want to use in the future, like escorting, escorting uh, strikers or setting up, like I said, a bar cap that is not a normal air superiority mission. It's just a BVR sweep going on and killing everybody and sanitizing the area mm -hmm. is a little bit different. Um, Marine Corps is really, Marine Corps Navy is really, really good at that. And so, we do some things really well. The Air Force does some things really well. So it's a great um, combined, uh, if, if everyone's lit, ready to listen and learn, it can be an extraordinary um, uh, uh, learning uh, environment for both groups. What was your introduction to the Air Force like then? I mean, were, were you, you know, were they pleased to see you? Was it, uh, um, uh, you know, something that, um, you know, got off to a good start? Well, I immediately, when I did the exchange, I immediately went to uh, the RAG or the RTU, uh, which was at Tyndall Air Force Base and got a, a quick TX course. They're happy to see everyone there. Um, that's just, uh, it was a very quick course. Uh, and they did things, that, you know, the second flight, uh, your second flight is a, a max burner takeoff, you know, vertical, and you just, your, your eyes are wired. Then you go out and do, it's on the syllabus, you're going to do tail slides. Well, you wouldn't do a tail slide in an F-18. I mean, not intentionally. But the they're just to show the power and the capability of the airplane being combat spread with another instructor. I was, of course, had an instructor in the back seat, pull the nose up 85 degrees, pull back power, and then just put power back in and climb. And you're just going, this is sick. <laughs> so that's, but the TX course was really quick. And so I will tell you the HOTAS systems in the Hornet and the Eagle are, are different completely different. Uh, I, so I did have some buffoonery, like if I wanted to talk on the radio uh, in a BFM engagement, I would sometimes pop the speed brake. Uh, not a good tactic uh, when you're already getting beat up by the instructor. But so there was some learning on the HOTAS. Uh, but other than that, it was a, a pleasure to fly. It was an A model. Uh, and then uh, I got maybe 20 hours, 30 hours in that airplane, not many, um, 15, 16 flights, some, you know, basic tactics. And then you go to your fleet squadron, which mine was the 58th, and they will get you up to speed or mission ready. Um, so that's, that's how that worked. Now going to the squadron, um, that was uh, interesting showing up there. Um, uh, reporting aboard. I'll never forget it. I was really excited. It was like, uh, it was 89 March. Yeah. The spring of 89. And I'm really excited to go fly, uh, this airplane now because I had a taste of the, the A model and this was a C model, a miss of C, which is a good airplane with bigger, mo better motors and lots more capability. So pretty excited to do that. And I walk in the squadron and the CO is not there. Um, the operations officer, I check in in my military manner, you know, Captain McGill reporting, and he goes, don't unpack your bags. I think we're canceling this exchange tour. 
and then talk about letting the air out of your balloon. Yeah. I don't know if he was messing with me or, um, but I thought they were serious. Uh, uh, but, but I did unpack. There was no way I was leaving. I was there, but um, it, it, it all worked out. Uh, that, that squadron was led um, by the infamous Paco Geisler. Uh, and that he was, he like as Manfred was, Manfred Reach, we talked about him uh, last time as he was in Marine Aviation. Paco was the icon in the F 15 community, just one of the finest pilots, greatest guys I've ever met. A, a true, uh, true leader and uh, a, a jokester. I mean, just funny as can be. Uh, I didn't meet him until I'd been in the squadron maybe three weeks. I'd seen him. But uh, in the Air Force, they don't, uh, I'd always go to check in to say, you know, hey, I'm your exchange guy. Uh, he was never in his office. Uh, those back then, they, wore, they didn't have rank on their shoulders. They had these stars on their sleeves. I didn't understand what that meant. Uh, I think it was for every 500 hours, you got a star on your sleeve. Um, and Paco was a young looking skipper. Uh, and I do remember after about three weeks of checking in his office, uh, I was getting a little frustrated and here comes this guy walking down the hallway. Uh, I look at him, I say hi, and he gives me this look like what he's got his flight suit zipped halfway down and uh, he looks like a J.O. And he basically knocks me into he puts he walks up to me as I walk by. I say, hey, how you doing? He, he jacks me up against the wall and then goes into the CEO's office. So, so I turn around, I walk into the CO's office and the secretary is sitting there. And so I go, I go, is the CO here? And it's him. He was joking. He, you know, he's just finally, hey, welcome aboard. But it'd take like three weeks of trying to find the skipper. And then the first time I see him, he knocks me against the wall and is goofing with me. And, <laughs> um, but that's his sense of humor. It, uh, I really, uh, they really took me in uh, very well. I was very surprised when I got to the squadron that there were no pilots in the squadron. It was empty. It was always empty. And I didn't figure it out until I got a clearance, a certain level clearance, uh, that I was allowed to go back in the, uh, we call it the vault, the locked areas. And that's where the squadron was. And uh, unlike the Marine Corps, where everyone has a job, you can be the coffee mess officer, you can be the admin officer, you can be the ops officer, but you're, you've got a job, a real job. Uh, and flying is your secondary uh, job in some respect. In the Air Force, at least in this squadron, you were a flyer. There's very few jobs. I ended up being a flight commander. That was one of the jobs. Um, but very few jobs. Your job was to le learn weapon airing and learn how to fly your aircraft as best as you could. And I will tell you, Steve, when I walked and finally got into the vault, and I'd see all these first lieutenants studying. They knew as much about weaponeering uh, or the capabilities of, I'll uh, say, the AIM-7 or the AIM-9 uh, that I did. And I'm talking about the, the, the physical dynamic, the physical and the, uh, well, not the, they knew everything about the missile that you would, that's graduate level stuff in their first lieutenants. Mm -hmm. So that stuff you you learned at Top Gun that you would teach uh, every every guy in that squadron had that, and I think Paco instilled that in the squadron. You wanted to be, you, you hope you could be as good as this guy. And for a squadron commander, uh, uh, if you to emulate a squadron commander, not only through his leadership but through his ability, his tactical capability. Not many O fives can fly an airplane the way he could. Mm. So you always wanted to see if you could beat him. I mean, that's pretty good. You know, you got weapons officers with lots of time uh, that are just captains that are really great, great pilots. And we had a couple of them, but then, you know, your CO is as good as anybody. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a, it was a great, uh, great entry. It took maybe a hundred, I, I think, um, uh, get, a, I think, you know, just like anywhere you show up, it's very competitive. So the guys kind of look around and say, okay, what's this guy going to do? Is he uh, to become an IP, to become a, a section lead or a, a two ship lead 
division lead, four ship lead, mission commander, IP. There's a, it's a hierarchy and everyone's working their way up to get there. Uh, and not everyone can do it. So there's a, there's a competitiveness in there and they go, okay, where's this guy going to fit in? Where is he going to go? You know, and, uh, I could feel that. And, and it's justified because these guys are here before me and they've got time in the airplane. Um, it didn't take long um, to, to really get become part of the squadron uh, to let them know that I'm not a threat. I'm not going to their weapon school. Um, but I did go through all those upgrades relatively quickly. I think um, I had about 150 hours in the airplane and uh, just cause uh, popped up, and uh, you know that's the first time that the F one seventeen became public uh, uh, in a strike down uh, in uh, Panama. But Paco picked an Eagle Sly. You're going to fly on my wing on this. I think the Eagles were an afterthought, but we sent a bunch of Eagles, and I was on his wing for that. And we went down to uh, between Cuba and the Yucatan Peninsula and did loops to music while they went in and. Uh, did their thing. Um, so uh, Paco had some confidence in me, I guess. Uh, and I think by the time I had about 300 hours in the airplane, I had gotten all the calls in the squadron um, and became a flight commander. So IP and, and, and the IP was probably the hardest, hardest part and probably the most rewarding uh, to be able to try to teach people how to fly the F-15. Let me take you back just to, to just cause them. Wasn't there a story, an anecdote about you flying on Paco's wing? Was it something to do with the radio frequency or isn't there a story there? Uh, he could tell it, but um, yeah, the only thing I remember is uh, it was snow. It was actually snowing at Eglin. It was cold. It was nasty weather. And he goes, we're going to do a mill power takeoff, which I did not understand why we'd want to do a mill power takeoff with all the ordnance we had on it slippery runway and bad weather but we did and we're flying in trail i'm flying in trail with him and then we join up and head south and we pick up a cap there's a lot of chatter going on and you can see from the north coming down you could almost walk across the gulf there were so many c-130s they had their lights on there were uh, it was a it was a lot there were a lot of airplanes coming down um our way and there was a lot of chatter going on and a lot of directives from uh, the air combat command, I think it was AWACS, I don't know. Uh, and so, uh, the air force was really big on authentication, you know, like they would say alpha Delta and you're supposed to say Lima Charlie or something. I don't know, but there's a list of these authenticators on your knee board. It's in the brief. And so they're trying to get us to authenticate. And, and so they keep saying whatever our call sign was authenticate, blah, blah. And Paco goes, do you know what the hell they're saying? Do you know what they're saying? And I go, I don't know. You're leading this damn thing. <laughs> so that was the anecdote. And uh, uh, I helped them out a little bit with the code words. And uh, after that, we ended up, uh, we couldn't go back home and end up landing in uh, t uh, uh, Tampa, McDill Air Force Base. And uh but it was a, it was a, that was the anecdote of essentially stated is that uh, I just said, I don't know, you're leading this thing. Uh, but I did give him the codes in the back radio. So just so he could save face. Let, let's return then just to the, uh, the C model, the MSIP to um, C model. What was your assessment of it then in terms of how, you know, how good it was? What sort of qualities did it have that, mm you were um, you know pleased to see or amazed by well, i mean how did you how did you take to it i it was um it was fantastic the we had the big mo we had the 220s nice motors uh with the deeks the digi digital electric uh, engine controls so uh the throttles were very responsive kind of like the hornet the hornet was really easy you know idled the full burner at 80 knots it didn't matter what what uh, realm of flight you were in. Um, the 220s were similar to that. The radar in the Eagle was extraordinary. Um, 
and it, it needed to be for an air supremacy or air superiority fighter. And now I know why I didn't like the Eagle guys that much because they had so much situational awareness that I never had in the Hornet. Uh, and no offense to the Hornet, but this again is 35 years ago. And uh, both airplanes uh, were built at the same time. Uh, the Eagle just had so much more capability in the air to air realm that it was a true awakening. And it honestly, Steve, it's target stuck out so big uh, that you had to be, you had to be really a poor aviator if you could not um, sort and engage that airplane the way it was built uh, uh, to be used. Uh, the trick with that airplane was essentially getting into the, um, if you did get into a visual fight is how to best employ it. And you could make it move pretty well, um, but I did learn if you got the nose low, uh, it, it, did, it didn't have the responsiveness of the Hornet if the nose was, if you got really low. So you didn't want to get low and slow with the nose down on the Eagle. Why is uh, that? Well, I, I, I can't explain the aerodynamics of the aircraft, um, but it, it just, it, you did not have the alpha cap, the high alpha capability uh, that you had in the Hornet. What you had, though, was an extraordinary amount of thrust in a 9G airplane. That, uh, that's how you employed the airplane. So if someone, if you're fighting against a Hornet and they wanted to get slow, um, you could do that. Uh, you had to be pretty dang good to do it. And as I said, I think before, uh, it really got down to the, the quality of the aviator because uh, either airplane, there's an edge in certain ways. You could make the Eagle dance. The Eagle would do things. And I learned at that squadron, from great guys like uh, Rob Grader, Cheese Grader, weapons officer. He had hands, he could fly BFM and he was a pleasure to go up and fight against because he'd show you stuff and then you'd learn how to do it. And uh, you could make that airplane do some extraordinary things uh, in the BFM realm, as long as you knew where the weaknesses were. And getting slow and no slow was a definite weakness. It does not want to, it, the airplane did not want to, it wouldn't come out. It, you know, if your nose is down at 180 knots, you've got to keep going down to get some airspeed because you're not going back up. So that, but that's a minor flaw. It's not a flaw. I mean, it's there, the wing's phenomenal. You can go up to 50,000 feet with no problem. I mean, it's, and Maneuver, maneuverability on that airplane, it was a little bit different, a lot different than the Hornet because it required, in my mind, a very smooth um, entry into high G or maneuvering. You know, the yaw and pitch axis um, were very critical in the Eagle. You could, if you were ham fisting it, just like you could ham fist the Hornet and you wouldn't uh, hurt it. You could over G the Eagle very easily and you had these uh, great tones that would come up, single rate beeper when you were moderately handling the airplane, a double rate beeper meant if you keep going, uh, you're gonna break something. And so when you were maneuvering the airplane in high G environment, uh, you had to do it smoothly. You had to understand roll and, and pitch. You, you, you couldn't just ham fist it. If you did it, you broke the airplane. I mean, just you, you would over G it. Uh, which is something you didn't have to worry about in the Hornet. You really had to, the Eagle required a little more aviator skill it, to, to, to maximize the performance of the airplane, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I, I was wondering whether or not your time on the A4, because you said a similar thing about that. You know, you, 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 when you had students, when you were SIRGRAD, you would teach them to treat it a bit more gently. I wonder whether or not that A4 time came to bear. It, yeah, I think it's the fact that I, I didn't, I didn't enjoy, uh, I would probably get airsick if, you know, slapping the airplane around and, you know, we called it killer snakes in the cockpit. If you're just taking the stick and whipping <laughs> it around and you don't have a clue where you're going, I think a smooth, smooth use of, of, of all of the, uh, the forces that you had smooth implementation. Now it can be a great, it's always going to be aggressive, but you do it smoothly when you go to, you know, put on nine G's or when you do a max break turn, uh, when someone rolls in at 3,000 feet on you. Uh, but you have to remember that the roll and the pitch and the cast system, uh, you could easily over-G the airplane or stress the airplane in a way uh, that you were done. 
So uh, smooth application always seemed to work for me. Uh, not that it wasn't extraordinarily aggressive because it was, but it was smoothly implemented where at the end of the flight, you can pull up all your blend codes and what you wanted was anywhere from 98 to hundred percent all the way down. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of, you knew you flew the airplane pretty well that day. What are those codes? Blend codes at the end. They're just codes to see uh, when you're in, you're getting gas and I can't remember what blend stands for, but you would pull up this screen and you would see all the axes, the G's you pulled and, uh, you know, roll and pitch, how, you know, what percentage of the airplane's capability essentially you put on it. Okay. So, you know, if you got all hundred percent, that was a pretty good day. Yeah. And okay. that, that rarely happens, but it does. So, so you talked about tactics and the exchange of ideas then, and, and obviously I'm not going to ask you to share those tactics, although some of them may be out of date, but, what I was curious to know was, were you broadly doing the same things then in the Marine Hornet world and the Air Force F-15 world, and, and actually what it came down to was nuance and subtlety and small tweaks here and there? Or we did you go into that environment and see very, very different applications for the same weapons? I mean, we're talking AIM-7, AIM-9. There, there was an extraordinary difference, primarily just due to the fact that the Eagle community had such a great platform that wasn't sharing time with the, the ability to do the intellectual properties, I guess, of the, of the flight computer or, uh, or, or the radar, uh, wasn't sharing time with tracking ships at, a, you know, hundreds of miles or uh, this, this radar was made for one thing. And so the situational awareness you had on every airplane that was out there essentially along with a terrific Ross uh, radar warning suite gave you a, a situational awareness that you just didn't have in the Hornet. And that was 35 years ago, I'm just saying. So it was a world of difference. Uh, they're employing ordinance, they're doing things uh, that we could do and we tried to do. But if you didn't have raw gear in your airplane, which the fleet the squadron I was in, you maybe have one set of raw, one, one, one scope between in 12 airplanes. You didn't even know if you were getting targeted in the Eagle. You knew immediately when someone was targeting you and surprisingly enough, an Eagle, the Eagle community can be very, you're almost a defensive, you're a very offensive aircraft, but you work in a very defensive mode. If you're getting targeted, well, you're not just going to walk into that missile. Right. I mean, you're going to uh, you're going to you're going to uh, employ a tactic uh, to get away from being targeted and let your wingman go after, you know, continue if he's not targeted or she's not targeted. So uh, the raw gear taught you to be very defensive. But if you weren't targeted, you would go in there like a gorilla and just beat up everybody. In the Hornet community, you really didn't know if you were targeted or not. So you just went walking in there. And so that's why it was so frustrating when you go and debrief at a red flag and they'd say, well, all the Hornets are dead and they'd have all the fly outs, you know, it's eight Eagles against, you know, 10 Hornets or a squadron of Hornets. And you can see all the missile fly outs and you just go, yeah, I didn't even know I was targeted. Once we got into the visual arena. So, you know, you don't want to really get in the visual arena in the F-15, but if you do, it's uh, it's effective. And in the Hornet, you just wanted to get in the visual arena because then we thought we had an advantage. So uh, it was a great eye-opener and very frustrating to me as a Marine to see two airplanes that went down the same, built at the same place at the same time with such different capabilities. Are there sort of, you mentioned on our last call, NECT, uh, not non cooperative target recognition, and, and I, had, I had heard that that and some other technologies that were available, the Navy had declined to buy for their aircraft because the Navy view was, well, we, we're going to be t- you know protecting a, a task force, the carrier battle group, and anything flying towards it that doesn't identify it, we're going to kill it. So it doesn't matter if we know exactly what it is. But was there a, a sort of philosophical element to that then as well? So you've got the conflict between... Uh, you know, a radar that has to work in the air-to-ground, air-to-sea, and air-to-air environment, but also has been deliberately, um, you know, sort of detuned for certain use cases. Uh, did, did that come into play as well? I think it. it, it what if you didn't know, um, 
if you didn't know your limit, how limited you were, then you wouldn't complain. Yeah. I mean, I mean, on WTA Top Gun grad, the greatest airplane around. And then I got an Eagle and went, well, F-18 is a fine airplane. <laughs> uh, I mean, honestly, but it's, it is, uh, I did have, you know, philosophically, I was, you know, I usually just say what I think and philosophically, I was, I was very frustrated um, that the Hornet didn't have more, after flying the Eagle, that the Hornet didn't have near the capability of the Eagle mm. at that time. I don't know how it is now. So, so you described your um, your sort of progression through through the squadron um, in terms of those hierarchies becoming you know section lead, flight lead, um, instructor pilot, and and of course you're going to talk us through it. But your first mission of Desert Storm was to lead a big a big group, a big strike package. How mm. much time were you getting to spend then at Eglin leading lots of eagles? Well, uh, Paco was phenomenal. He built a squadron. We had uh, we had I think. Uh, three three uh patch target arms or three guys uh that had gone through weapons school every jo or every first uh first lieutenant was extraordinarily gifted there were no strap hangers there were no uh there were no no marginal really marginal aviators it was just a very very good squadron that paco took to red flag or green flag at every opportunity even going up to cold lake to fight anyone anytime. So we were pretty good at large force employment. And um, and that's where you wanted to be, you know, eight eagles out there um, uh, is a pretty, 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 we did that a lot. Uh, so Paco really got, we had no idea. We were, we were, Randy Cunningham, Duke Cunningham, you know, um, the only uh, Navy, you know, Navy ace from Vietnam had a great saying and Top Gun usually you fight like a train. And we truly did that under uh, Paco's uh, leadership. Uh, I remember you'd wear that the 58th patch, you'd go into the O club and you could just see other, you know, uh, Viper guys go, oh, she's the gorillas are here again. You know, the gorillas are here because we were, uh, we had a great reputation. The airplane was great. We were not, I don't know if we were, I, I tried to, I tried to help them a little bit. I don't this sounds really arrogant. I tried to lower the arrogance at a, a little bit and let them understand that these guys uh, flying these other airplanes are doing the absolute best they can. Uh, a little more compassion. Cause I do remember, you know, a lot of Eagle guys that I would uh, prefer to take out back and smack around than uh, because they were just, but uh, Honestly, uh, we had a pretty humble group of great aviators, and that was a pleasure to be around. And so Paco had got us, gotten us ready for large force employment. He loved doing that. He when, was good at it. When did you get us uh, sort of first wind then of what was happening out? Well, obviously Iraq invaded Kuwait um, in a most unexpected fashion, I think in August of 1990. But, but when right. did you first hear what was going on and um, when did you get an indication that your squadron would be going? Um, this is, I think we were at Cold Lake. Uh, Paco had left the squadron and we had got a new squadron commander, Bill Teal, Tonic. Um, I think we were at Cold Lake doing a graduation exercise or doing something. And uh, we had heard some rumblings about something going on in Saudi and near Saudi. Um, obviously when we got home, uh, and after Saddam had invaded Kuwait, uh, the Langley, uh, squadron took off almost immediately. And, uh, we were told to pack our bags and just hurry up and wait. So we probably, we deployed, I think I, I looked at it the other day, Steve, um, cause I thought we'd talk about this. We left, I think on, I wrote it down, um, with, uh, 28 August. So probably three weeks of waiting. Uh, and primarily the wait was for tankers. Um, and we were a priority, uh, as fighters, but, uh, of course your attack aircraft, you can't just do stuff with just fighters. So, um, you need to get the attack. So you're, you're waiting in the queue. 
And it was, uh, you know, threw, threw your bag in the corner by the bed and you just waited till it was time to go. And uh, for us, it was 28, uh, you know, 28 August. I wanted to be accurate on that. And uh, I, I, I was uh, fortunate enough to lead a group over, the second group over. It was about 14 hours, 14, a little over 14 hours of flying. Uh, lots of tanking. Uh, and uh, the interesting part was I'd, I'd been deployed to Egypt before with the F-18 during a, a thing called Bright Star. Uh, and I, maybe that's why they had me leading this, because once we the tankers dropped us off in the med, um, we were calm out, didn't talk to anyone, uh, went uh, from Alexandria, uh, north, F, north Egypt, uh, of e north Egypt. Uh, down to Luxor, across the Red Sea to Wedge, and then flew up to Tobuk, uh, where we were going to be based, and that was all calm out. Cool, and, come out. Uh, yeah, no talking. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, that was uh, that. It was just after fourteen hours. You know, you're just hoping to get a beer uh, or something, but uh, all they handed you was a water bottle because there was no drinking in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> which was, uh, uh, at least there was no legal drinking in Saudi Arabia. Um, but uh, anyway, 14 hours, that was, uh, that was fun. Uh, but, um, not a very comfortable airplane to sit in for 14 hours. What, what did you know then about the Iraqi Air Force? Uh, presumably the, those three weeks of waiting had been um, given to study and um, intelligence briefings and those sorts of things. Absolutely. Yeah, we were getting uh, all ginned up, I will tell you, uh, and I know you've talked to him, Rick Tolini, a fantastic weapons officer. He was a squadron weapons officer. He took a group with him, advanced party, uh, can't remember how they got there, but they got their um, C, you know, uh, KC-10 or something, and they got into the a a AOR quickly, and we started getting back, you know, um, he, he started to develop a game plan for when we arrived, not knowing, I mean, we're always ready for combat. We went over with four by four with three tanks, you know, with uh, uh, four uh, AIM-7s and four AIM-9s, and uh, we were ready to go. I mean, that's the airplanes were ready to go. And as soon as we landed, Tallini's, you know, he had enough guys there that we immediately uh, set up caps uh, south of the Iraqi border and monitored and what the uh, Iraqi fighters were doing. And we did that 24 hours a day for the next several months, 24 hours. And so we flew a lot and we did train in the meantime. But while we were waiting those three weeks, we did get a lot of intel on the size of the Iraqi Air Force. It did seem impressive. I mean, I think it was like the fifth largest Air Force in the world. Uh, they were flying the MiG-29. So we did get some briefs on the MiG-29 and its capabilities which uh, with the AA-10 and AA-11 uh, seemed a very effective and could be a very uh, worthy adversary. Uh, so we were ready to, we figured, we, we did a lot of studying on how we would fight that airplane in a BBR war. It had some capabilities. Um, that IRSTS, uh, the infrared search and track, uh, is a is a great idea. Don't know how effective it is. Didn't know back then. Didn't know how effective it was, um, but it it was to me it was a big threat. I go, man, they can shoot something at me with a faster missile and turn away, and I don't even know it's coming. Um, that that's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they had a lot of them. Um, they had a pretty good size. Every other airplane they had didn't seem to really buy. I mean, F ones and Mirages uh, and uh, the Fox Bat. No, they were not really. We didn't see those as a true threat, but they did have numbers. So that's the kind of stuff we got ready for. It's just doing a lot of studying. Do, do you? So, so, I mean, if I can press a little bit on that, then so presumably in the Eagle, you're going to want to be coming downhill, you know, using a look down, shoot down capability, extending the range of the missile, going fast. They've got this IRST, so they can probably go a little bit lower, look up against the cold sky, see the heat of your, your afterburner or your, your exhaust. How do you mitigate against that then? How do you, I mean, do, yeah. you, do you have to drastically change what you're doing or are there just some little sneaky tricks you can use? Yeah, uh, that, that was a, that, that is a very tough, question. I mean, how do you fight something 
that could launch something at you that you can't see. I mean, obviously, if we're up high and fast, we can get a missile to them pretty quickly and make them defensive. Uh, the whole thing boils down to their capability. How good is their radar to find us? Even with the IRSTS, can they find us? And then, and then, can they let that the uh, Archer go? Um, that was that was something that we discussed, but it was something we I don't know if we really had an answer for Steve. Um, I mean, our idea was to reach out and get them further out. Uh, just knowing that we were in that regime, and our shoot and our shoot ROE uh, when we finally established it. Uh, would have allowed us to shoot way out there so we wouldn't have to face that close in threat. What do you think they knew about you? I mean, did you care about what they thought they knew about you? You know, uh, no, did not care. But uh, typical with what we do is we treat every adversary like they're us. So we trained to a level that we were fighting ourselves, which you know, we turn, I, I, you know, you turn everyone into a giant because uh, you want to slay the giant, but um, then you maybe later find out they're, they're not quite as qualified as you had thought. Mm. But I think that's the way you, that, that's the way you have to train. That's what we did. So we really didn't care about their tactics, their capabilities. We knew we had a better airplane. Uh, and so we, we didn't know what their, cap you know, we didn't know how often they flew. We didn't know much about their training or who trained them, you know, where I mean, we know where they got the airplane. So we assume some of those countries trained them, but we don't know. Hmm. We didn't know at the time. And, and what about the, the IADS, the integrated air defense system? Was that uh, something that weighed on your mind? Yeah, not, a, you know, not, a, I mean, we, she's weird there in August and the invasion, uh, we didn't start until January 17th. So um, we did, all we had was Intel on, how heavily defended airfields would be. Um, but uh, I don't think we really talked about the integrated air defense all that much. I mean, our idea would be to not fly into it, um, you know, fly around it. Uh, and, so, and I know that sounds simple, and it, it is fairly simple to, to devise your route uh, not to go fly through those things. Sometimes it's unfortunate and you do it. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, generally you could work around. Uh, if you knew where uh, this, the, the, the IADs were, where you knew where the mezzes were, then you, you really didn't go in there. You waited for, uh, we had plenty of other terrific airplanes that could take those things out. Hmm. So that's kind of the, our, our, our mindset. So, so was that, you know, you have just said you weren't that concerned with their tactics or their capabilities, but they'd obviously been at war with Iran for ten years. They had some, you know, combat experienced and seasoned pilots. Um, you know, brave, brave guys. And was there any part of you that was thinking that you know have they got something up their sleeve? Are we gonna are we gonna have to deal with the unexpected, or are they going to be completely predictable? Oh yeah, I, I had we, yeah. Like I said, I think we treated them like we were fighting ourselves. So we expected some sophisticated tactics, especially since they were uh, battle worn and tested. Um, so, but I, I can't really give you more than that. But, but it's interesting you said that you didn't really sort of look at the MiG twenty five as a threat. Why was that then? Well, I mean, the only cap the capability. Right? The capability I had was uh, get high, really, you know, get really high, and then shoot an AA6 at you from 50 miles. Well, our our gear would let us know that we're being targeted, so the chances of being surprised by that were basically nil. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're targeted, we're going to leave. We're going to maneuver, and while he's trying to shoot you with that thing, a wingman will shoot him with something else. So. Um, you, you can't, they, they couldn't target eight Eagles. They could target one, yeah. you know, so good luck. Go ahead and target one and the other seven are going to annihilate you. Uh, and they generally didn't go. Uh, we watched their tactics during Desert Shield and they might put an F1 with a, a MiG-25 and come south at high altitude and the F1 might dive to the ground. 
uh, you know, and come in low, but that's nothing for us. I mean, okay, we saw that. We see that stuff every day in training. So, you know, they're, the fox bat, in the BVR world, the fox bat, where it's rain is, didn't seem like a huge threat to us. Now, in close, uh, it looks a lot like an eagle, as Rick Tolini will tell you, uh, in his shoot down, a uh, remarkable shoot down of uh, uh, a fox bat in a turning engagement. Um, it looks just like an eagle, uh, except it doesn't turn like one. And I know you talked to Clouseau about that. Um, yeah, but in the it's 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 wheelhouse was long range shoot down at us, and I, we didn't find that to be a huge threat. At least I didn't think it was a huge threat. When when did you discover then? Um, slide that you were going to lead that first daylight mission on the 17th of January? So the squadron had four, I guess I was considered one, had three uh, weapons officers. The primary weapons or had gone to weapons school, put it that way. Um, Rick Tolini was our weapons officer. We also had uh, Rob Grader, uh, Cheese, who shot down two F1s in the first night. And then, of course, we had uh, John Kelk, who got the first kill of the war. Uh, uh, so we had so, uh, it was a great group of seasoned aviators, uh, and then they included me. I don't I don't know if it was the CO's idea. I don't know if it was Rick Tolini's idea, but the four of us were going to lead all the OCA missions. So there's a 72 hour frag that Clouseau had had gotten from whoever is sending us missions. I was just a I was just a fighter pilot to Clouseau was the planner and the leader of, of our uh, group in that way and tactics and, and uh, planning. So Clouseau had uh, worked with Air, the Air Force, uh, whoever's leading, uh, you know, give, doing the mission plan. I'm sorry about this because this uh, is kind of vague because I wasn't really involved in it. But essentially, for the first 72 hours, the four of us were going to lead two OCA missions a day. Uh, and just the four of us, we were going to lead. Everyone else was, you know, and, and please don't take this the wrong way, but everyone, we were leading OCA. That was the, our four. So we all had missions, all four of us. Tolini, of course, was leading H hour at 0300, uh, the first wave of Eagles in. Uh, F 15C models in. I don't want to say anything about the E models. And, um, and then I was given uh, the first daylight uh, strike uh, uh, several hours later. Uh, I can't remember when we, uh, I remember Clouseau uh, saying to me, hey, Sly, you're going to lead day one. Uh, I'm leading this because he had Kelk and, and uh, Grader with him on the first night. Uh, what it's really not, it's 3 a.m. And so I was leading the next morning, uh, mission, uh, just the air to air part, right? So the uh, target was El Tocatum Airfield, uh, just outside of Baghdad. Um, the overall mission commander was, uh, I can't remember, Deal, I think was his name, really good guy, based out of Abu Dhabi. Uh, and he was going to lead 40 F-16s into the target. And uh, so I, I had that mission. We had a little vault, a little modular air-conditioned building, uh, and I spent hours and hours in there and also jumping around on C-130s to go visit with uh, the first wing that was in Dahran uh, because I was using eight of their eagles, or I was assigned, they were assigned to, to me, eight eagles, and then uh, I flew to Abu Dhabi uh, to meet with the Shaw guys uh, to see what their tactics were going to be in going into the target area and how we could best support them. So um, I had I had months. I wouldn't say it didn't happen just the day before. I had, I had months to plan uh, the first couple of missions. The second mission I was leading. Uh, I won't say leading because as an air superiority guy, you're just going out in front of them. Um, but then it was uh, uh, tornadoes uh, that were based with us into a Western area target. And that was a midnight TOT after the day one. So you had a couple missions you were leading uh, the first for the first three days. 
I hope that made sense. Yeah, I, I wonder if it would now be a good time to break out the your map and maybe sort of talk through what um, you know. Um, yeah, I can try this. Well, it, this may not be totally uh, seamless. It's okay. But, um, we'll edit it to make it look good. We'll, we'll try this real quick. So I just give you an idea of what we're looking at here. Um, this this is the actual map I used in the briefing. Can you see that okay, Steve? Yeah, yeah I can see that. Yeah. Okay, so this is the actual map that I used to brief. And so you can tell, and if anyone knows me, for me to write all this stuff down, I couldn't do overnight. I mean, this is stuff that uh, it took months of work, not months of work, but essentially a lot of time to draw all this out. And what this map basically shows, and I'll show you the players here in a minute, but it's a timeline essentially of where my eight Eagles will be when the strike package pushes. Okay, so um, if you're looking at the top of the screen right now, if you can see my cursor, this is where I'm supposed to be at this. This is where I'm supposed to be. So we can talk about planning and what actually happens because a uh, plan is great, but it usually falls apart uh, pretty quickly. So this is the plan where I'm going to be with uh, Rick Tolini uh, and his group, and this is going to be me. And then uh, down here, uh, there's going to be um four more eagles with eight weasels and then there's four more eagles kind of doing a bar cap down here with the strike package so this is a a, a picture in time of where everyone will be uh in order for this strike package to push so the the mentality was if we up front encounter a huge turnout in fighters uh, that we're not going to go. The strike package is not going to go. Um, that obviously did not happen. Uh, and everything went pretty seamlessly. Um, you can see, I mean, I can, I don't know if you wanted me to zoom in on stuff or, can, uh, or can, that pretty much shows you. So I can just, you know, if you look down here, um, I mean, that's, that's a lot of F-16s. Yeah. And over here, is there uh i'm sorry i'm not great with this but uh call signs and their push times and key times for them for when i and so my plan was basically to go out uh 10 minutes prior to them pushing i gave that and so at that point in time i would be up there these these uh weasels these f uh these were um f4 g's mm -hmm. with four um Eagles from Langley, they would be in that position. And then I would be up here uh, at that point. I would be up at this point in the mission. And this was the target area that they were going into. So, so, so basically... Your Xerix 71 and uh, Cluzo's flight is Penzoil. Is that well, correct? that's the plan. But the okay. call signs changed uh, probably the day of the mission. So this that's why... This has been done ahead of time. Um, you know, this is here. I know where the strike package is going. The green arrow is where uh, the sweep is going to be, and it's going to be a pure, you know, uh, sweep of the AOR uh, BVR sweep, air superiority sweep. And you can see I've, what I've done is, you know, I've kind of put in SAM rings. They're not to scale, but they're enough to see that this is how we were going to maneuver. And the numbers around here are the points that you're going to hit so you don't fly through some of these um, sur known surface air missile uh, facilities, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we're never going to fly into the target. I mean, that's just stupid. We're going to get up here and secure the area, make sure it's good, maybe do a turn uh, if there's something coming from the north. But our biggest threat, honestly, was from El Tac and El Assad and Baghdad. Uh, so that's what we were looking at, and if nothing and if nothing came up, our route would be come back home through this route through the western part of Iraq. Yeah. So what, why then? So the triangles, the green triangles, are your waypoints, effectively, aren't they? Steer points. Um, yes. So why do you have a steer point that is four, and uh, I think there's another sort of one that's that's sort of odd that's out of sequence. So you go from three to five instead of three to four, and four is four says Ike. 
on it down there on the right hand side. Why is that then? Um, well, uh, some of those were standard, like Ike was a used by AWACS. So any kind of uh, air to air threat would be uh, for AWACS would be off of Ike. Okay. So, so that's your bullseye. Uh, yeah, it's a point that they used, and so it was. It was a point that we always had it in our in our in our set of okay. waypoints. So that's the best I can tell you on the numbers. I can't recall um, why they're numbered that way. I don't think there's huge significance other than there were some given numbers for bullseyes like Ike. There was another one out west. Um, I don't know where it is out here. Um, yeah, yeah. There's another one out here. I, I I don't have a good answer for you on that, sure. Steve. I'm sorry. It's and this is really old. You're really. I don't. I've not looked at this in a very long time. Um, this is just really old stuff. And but that's the. Go ahead. No, I was going to say so. Those little black uh, lines then with you know 16k, 13k. So that's your bingo fuel and. Right. So I can um, zoom back in on this a little bit. Um, so if, if we get up here and we have uh, less than 19,000 pounds of gas, it's time to leave. All right. If we've got 19,000 pounds of gas, we're going to continue sweeping the area looking for threats. All right. And that was our mission was pure BVR sweep looking for threats. Because hmm. we did assume that there would be a large turnout in the daytime. We knew the Iraqi Air Force flew some at night, and obviously uh, with four kills uh, in the evening, three by us and one by uh, Langley, um, they were obviously going to be, uh, they do fly at night, but uh, we figured their resolve would be much stronger in the daytime. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so yes, long story short, those, anything, these, any, these are yeah, fuel numbers, you know, 10K, you got to get out of here. Mm. You've got to go find a tanker. So, so, so you mentioned it then. Uh, you're, so this is obviously uh, looking at the times, 09, 10, 09, 12, 09, 13. Those seem to be the sort of push times then in your, in your plan here. Um, what time do you step and what is your um, understanding then of what's already happened? I mean, are you, you know, you're going to go to war sort of you've got the three other squadron uh, weapons officers who are, have gone out and and, um, and and experienced Iraqi Air Force. Have they had an opportunity to tell you what they've seen so you're primed for what you might see? Uh, <laughs> any handover at all? Well, they had a look on them that was uh, one that uh, we would all have after our first mission because they came back. We were trying to eat breakfast. I, I couldn't really eat. I was so nervous, um, in all honesty. Uh, um, but they came back and they had that, uh, a couple of them had the thousand, uh, yard stare and, uh, they were tired, uh, and they'd been shot at, you know, there were surface stair ordinance. They had shot ordinance. So they, um, they were now seasoned combat veterans. And I was, you know, we were all jealous, you know, they had, they'd gone out five hours before us kicked butt. Uh, and now it was, uh, at least it was my turn with my group. And um, uh, they, the only thing is that uh, I just saw that it wasn't, uh, there was nothing glamorous about it and there was no joy. It was just, wow, you know, this is, this is tough. It's, I mean, shooting, at, shooting missiles at night at an adversary um, is tough. Uh, it's, the stress is phenomenal. And uh, you could tell by the looks in their eyes after their first mission that, something they were different hmm. and that's something we all saw uh, i think the first time you got shot at how, how did you feel then in terms of uh, confidence in terms of um fear what, what emotions were going through you then um uh, honestly i was a, a big you can see this map this map is the brief that i used for the group um, I did not brief with the F-6. They knew this, that what we were doing, but they were doing their own brief in Abu Dhabi. Uh, this was just our brief, um, uh, the uh, 16 Eagles that I had uh, with Intel and the wing commander and every, you know, people and some strap hangers that were uh, watching uh, the brief. Um, but I think the, the unknown, the what ifs, I always try to what if everything, um, 
I think I learned that at Top Gun and WTI. So I think we had a really good, solid plan. Um, and uh, the big things were the unknowns, the what ifs, what if, so, and, and I have a couple for you in a minute. Um, but I felt confident that we had a solid plan. I was not, I was very nervous. I'll just be honest with you. Um, and my, my kind of prayer was, Lord, just don't let me uh, mess this up, you know, because uh, uh, it's real, even though you, and so I think the funny thing, Steve, is it's, I was nervous in the brief, uh, nervous until I got to the airplane, walking around the airplane, you're alone. They just drop, you know, you're dropped off in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and you 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 walk around your airplane, you make sure it's good to go. And finally, once you start up the airplane, boom, uh, you're compartmentalizing and you're ready to go do your mission. Yeah. So that was kind of the, the dynamics of the first time. I, I, I never knew what cotton mouth was until I started briefing and I kept drinking water um, because I was so bloody nervous because uh, I just didn't want to fail. Yeah. It wasn't that that was it. Don't let anyone down. You know, that was that's a strange mentality, but that was my mentality. Don't mess this up. Can you talk us through the mission and how, how did it go? Yeah. Um, can we get, do we, we don't, do we need the map anymore? No, it's up to you. I mean, if you want to use it for other purposes, you can, if not just hit stop sharing and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get back to where we yeah, were. Yeah. Uh, because you can see the general dynamic, the route of flights. And I, I, you know, I don't want to get into where the bandits were and, uh, um, but I can, uh, um, we never got to this point. Okay. I'll just tell you that right now. Um, uh, but this is, like I said, this, you can see the general, I can leave this up for a minute or two um, and uh, tell you, tell you um, once we pushed, uh, we got out to the area, which is way back down here, uh, lots of tankers and um, you're just waiting for your check-in time. I don't even see the F-16s. They're way over here somewhere. I'm over here somewhere on a tanker track uh, getting gas. And here's the first, uh, here's the first uh, gotcha. Uh, we were supposed to have two tankers. No offense to the tankers. We only have one. And um, that wasn't going to be good for us. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is interesting. Uh, in the Marine Corps, we generally just do, uh, I wouldn't say naval aviation, uh, uh, flexibility is our key uh, to air power, and um, we would rather uh, do something and beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission at times. I don't know if that was the same mentality with uh, my Air Force comrades, um, but here's one of, an issue right here. We had one tanker, and uh, we needed two, one for my four ship and one for Tolini's four ship, uh, Clouseau's. Uh, the, the Langley guys had their own, you know, they're back with the strike package. So they were uh, away. And uh, so my only concern was our eight at this time and uh, only one tanker. And I, uh, Clouseau said, well, I'll tell you, we're on the back radio talking. He goes, hey, let's just uh, cycle through your tanker. And I go, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, he goes, I go, go over there. Uh, it's only by 10 miles uh, to the west of us. There's an AWACS tanker, uh, KC-10. I go, go over there and take gas from that tanker. And he goes, I can't do that. I go, and so we actually had a discussion, um, I'll call it, um, about getting over there and getting gas because I I was not going to go short on gas because you can see I, I needed 19,000 pounds of gas just to get up here to do this mission. And I wasn't gonna cycle through a tanker and be low on gas with eight airplanes. So after a, a, a good long, not a good long discussion, cause we got on cap in plenty of time to push, uh, Clouseau went over and got gas and uh, just you know two minutes prior to push time, uh, we were all full of gas. And so I, I sat on my tanker and we kept cycling through my four. Clouseau did it over with the KC-10 and uh, probably three minutes prior to push my number three, Rory Drager, God bless him. Uh, his radar, go he's the alternate mission commander. His um, radar goes dead. So he's got a lead nose. So just struggle with getting gas, you know, now, you know, so you're getting all these things happen. You're getting things happening that you're really not expecting uh, is what I'm trying to say is you got a great plan, but then it starts to fall apart. Uh, luckily right at push time, 
uh, Rory's radar comes up and we're good to go. And we push out eight Eagles in the high thirties in the cons, letting everyone, not letting everyone know we're coming. Um, but that's uh, a wall of Eagles is essentially what we call it. Uh, a very effective, uh, force. And, um, honestly, I was surprised when we push, I kind of waited like a red flag. Okay. Knock it off, knock it off. It's over. Uh, they give up after the early hours of the war. I figured uh, there, this really isn't going to happen. But then when we pushed, it really, you know, okay, we're really doing this. I, I mean, I wasn't totally convinced uh, until uh, we started to push and AWOX came in and said, uh, on the primary radio, you've got two bandits south of the target area, uh, clear to kill at a very long range. And so that, that kind of got your attention and said, okay, uh, Wow, that's that's we're we're doing this. Um, again, like I said, you're, any apprehension you had prior to the brief or anything on the ground that's totally gone. Now you're fo totally focused on what you're going to go do. Um, so we had uh, eight eagles. Uh, there were two bandits uh, southwest of the target area at low altitude, and they, we were cl cleared to kill at a very long range. So the Eagle radar is pretty good. We looked out there and, and uh, we could see that there were two targets. They were low and slow, um, kind of just doing a uh, north-south cap, I would say, uh, just uh, you know, a 10 mile cap. Uh, um, let's see. Yeah, they were just doing, just, uh, they were low and slow, maybe a 10 mile cap, just going north and south. And uh, what, as we were going, as we kept going in, uh, it, it was very, very, very quiet. Uh, all you heard was AWACS and then uh, AWACS would use my call sign, which I can't remember what it was. And, and basically be one same, three same, or, or one same, or no, it was one same and then five, Tallini would say same. So it's very quiet. So it's, you've got a long way to go to intercept two airplanes. And uh, the cadence is AWACS one and five, AWACS one and five. And it's just no one else is talking. So, and, and so you're saying same as in you see on your, yeah, radar, we see the same. Yeah. yeah, we see the same thing that they see uh, just to make sure. And it's just basically a bra, a bearing range and altitude, you know, report. And so the same same just keeps the calm quiet. And it was a very nice cadence. It was really impressive. Nobody else was talking. We were talking on our back radios, basically, hey, we're not locking anyone up. We're not locking anyone up until we get within a weapons engagement zone where we can you know, use something. Um, uh, we're just going to look at them you know, and, and, and just make sure that there's no one behind them. When we got to a range of about 40, I guess about 40 miles, we looked way past where the two bandits were and realized that there's nothing else out there. Um, so at that point in time, uh, I decide uh, with Hoser's help on the back radio that uh, my four ship's going to go engage these two. Even though if you look at the formation, this is me over here, and this is where Clouseau is, and the bandits are over here, but I mean, we're further down. By all rights, I should have just sent Clouseau over there to go engage those bandits. But I'm leading this thing and I didn't do that. Uh, I decided with Hoser's help, and it really was his ape slide, we gotta go get these guys. So I kiss off uh, Hoser, I'm not Hoser, I, uh, to, uh, Clouseau, and he goes over the top of us and heads over towards El Assad and looks around and leaves. Right about the time uh, Clouseau passes over us um, and gets away, I get, um, and I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of this share map now. You can pretty much see it. You've seen it all. Um, right about the point that Clouseau crosses over the top of us, um, I get uh, uncorrelated launch indications from surface to air missiles. And uncorrelated just means that someone's looking at you and my raw can't tell me my can't tell me where the missiles are or where they're coming from or what direction I'm being locked up from. So it's uncorrelated. 
Um, so I knew it was, we, our term was mud. And I said one mud and, and I heard two say clean, three clean, four clean. And so now it was, the cadence is still going on with AWACS and AWACS has given us the range to the tar, uh, to the, uh, the bandits are just saying, you know, the bearing range and altitude, one same, three same. At the same time, we're getting raw indications of service to of launches. Um, and so our, our, our nice quiet cadence one, three, and uh, or, or AWACS one and three becomes now one saying, uh, you know, I'm uh, mud uh, uncorrelated. So now everyone's looking out and after probably another 30 seconds or 45 seconds, number four, Tony Schiavi uh, calls smoke in the air. I do not see anything, um, but I know I'm being targeted uh, according to my raw gear. Well, that changes everything, the dynamic real quickly. We are heading uh, in the direction that I showed you in the, on the green line. Uh, I immediately call for a break. And this is where you essentially do, if you can't see, the missile, then you do a series of orthogonal breaks, 90 degrees here, 90 degrees there. Um, we did jettison our wing tanks immediately. That's called combat one, uh, hit combat one. It's just a button to hit. Two tanks come off, give you some more maneuverability. And uh, I basically do orthogonal breaks down to the right. Hoser does them to the left with his number uh, four and with my number two in perfect formation. We lose probably 15,000 feet. The raw gear is always turned up very loud. So now it's gotten very noisy with AWACS giving us bearing range and altitude on the threat that's 40 miles away. The raw is going off. We're breaking, hitting chaff and flares and doing all the things you need to do to defeat the threat that you don't even see. And it can be very disorienting. We are now uh, 90 degrees to, the, to where the bandits are. I'm heading east with my wingman to get away from the threat. Hoser heading west with his wingman. We get past the threat. And uh, you can see the threat is now at six o'clock on the raw gear, not at 12 o'clock. So you can hear, it. I'm still getting raw indications that I'm locked up at the rear, but we're past them. So I, I, I tell my, I give my wingman a 90 left to come back heading towards the, the, the bandits. Hoser does the same thing. And I look out and Hoser's five miles away from me down low with his wingman and we're in perfect formation we're just split by five miles i mean after going through a sand break jetsing tanks doing all this stuff totally disoriented we come back and awax gives us the threat and you hear one three say and boom now we're going and you can pretty cool pretty scary really gets your now you're kind of in hyperdrive. I mean, your brain really is, I mean, you're, you're, you're angry uh, and you're feeling pretty aggressive after getting shot at. I mean, this is, this is real stuff going on here. Uh, but we did a great job of defeating the threat, turning back towards the bandits, and then our cadence was the same. Hoser got back in formation and we are good to go. Uh, this, this ate up, uh, you know, this thing started about 40 miles from the bandits at about 20 miles, uh, after doing all the maneuvers we were doing, we got to within 20 miles of where the bandits were capping. And for some reason, they turned north in their cap. And anyone, so a 20, mile, uh, 20 miles away from a supersonic adversary like the Eagle, and you turn away, uh, you're not going to come back and engage. You will just eat missiles when you come, when you come back. And, and so... Uh, you never turn away at 20 miles from a supersonic adversary uh, like the Eagle, unless you're going to land or be a decoy. And so I kept thinking, you know, again, going back to our training, that they are going to drag us into either the Mez or they're going to drag us into something. They're going to land and we're going to get a face full of something, either fighters or surface air missiles. But I kept saying, watch the drag, watch the drag. And I had the wingman looking way out past these two guys because we just gave them too much credit. All right. Long story short, at 20 miles, uh, they turn north and we're not going to let them go. So I say, push it up, push it up. We ramp down full afterburner as fast as the Eagle will go, um, which isn't, it's a fast airplane, but not all that fast. But now, you know, I've still got the raw gear going off in the back. 
The Eagle is not a whisper jet like the Hornet. It's very noisy on the inside when you're going that fast. We ramp down to maybe 8,000 feet. They're down at 500 feet or 1,500 feet, I think, and doing about 360 knots as they go away. And when they come turn back, we have closed the range to probably 12, 12 to 13 miles. And they turn back, which I'm stunned that they turn back. As they turn back, they're flying a, a formation that is pretty common. It's an echelon formation, you know, where the wingmen can slide from one side to the other. As they come back out of the turn, Hoser um, almost immediately, number three, calls Fox One. He has locked up uh, one of the bandits. And as he shoots, I'm looking at both band, you know, I'm on the radar now looking at both bandits and Hoser shoots and he, instead of going out to the west, he comes over the top of me. So I'm thinking in, in what we normally do is an azimuth uh, sort uh, that he's, he's kind of shot the guy that I was going to shoot. And I went, well, uh, there was another target right next to him. And I got lucky uh, in all honesty, because now the, the bandits have gone from 360 knots to 600 knots. And we're doing about 600 knots coming at them. So the range is closed, closes very, very quickly. As Hoser shoots, the, I just immediately go in with uh, the cursors and I get the other bandit and then I shoot. Uh, um, and luckily, you know, we, we got different bandits. I mean, he, he was, he knew, he got the one he wanted and I was trying to think, I go, dang, that's not, why is he, why is he coming over here to cool down the intercept? Because, um, but later we talked about it and I think I just grabbed the other guy and um, immediately offset because we're going to slow down this intercept because what I saw was 1290 knots of closure. I mean, it's the range is coming down so fast that this old, this 386 processor brain of mine was, it was going way too fast. You know, I mean, we're, I mean, it really happens quickly. Um, and I don't like my missile comes off and it goes straight to the ground. I watch it come off and it goes straight to the ground. I go, this is not right. So I immediately pitch back and shoot another missile. And this is, uh, I got time compression, which I read about in Vietnam. Time just stood still at the moment in time I shot the second missile. Uh, it came off, did its uh, roll, and it was all in slow motion. I mean, this, there was no sound in my headset, uh, in my helmet. Uh, I watched the missile come off. I could see it roll. I could see the yellow band, the brown band. And it just slowly rolls, goes off and it goes in a profile. Then within what seemed like a second or two, boom, all the noise comes back. I'm pitching back uh, um, uh, with, uh, to the east to slow down this intercept at about seven miles. We get a tally on two and uh, we're keeping them off because we think that they're trying to end turn us in standard Soviet style. Um, and they just keep coming. And I, I'll tell you the rest of the story here in just a second. Um, but uh, we offset them as best we can to slow down this intercept. But still, by the time our missiles hit, it's about a 9,000 foot slant range looking down. them, so less than a mile and a half. Uh, the range is closed very quickly. Um, Hoser's missile uh, goes right through the canopy of uh, his MiG-29. Uh, my missile, the first missile I shot, which I thought was like a camel, I would call it a camel, you know, just joking, a camel chaser was going down to the ground. It came from low up uh, and hit the uh, other MiG in the right uh, wing route. And then the second missile that I shot went through the fuselage. Um, very quickly, uh, we sanitized the area behind us. And I'm going to stop there just for a second, Steve, because the reason these bandits were going so fast as unbeknownst to us, there was a Navy strike package leaving uh, the AOR and they came over in our area and there were two Tomcats trailing an A6, I think it was an A6 strike package. And the MiG-29s found they were chasing the F-14s. So they never knew, I can only imagine what was going through their craniums because they are chasing someone and I'm sure they were getting raw indications and they couldn't figure out why they were getting raw indications. And then, you know, they ceased to fly. 
Um, but and I only knew about this was in a debrief a year later is that one of the Rios saw our engagement and I go well, that's not possible. And then in the debrief, you put all the pieces together. And what happened was they came out of their cap, the, the, F, the MiG-29s came out of their cap, and the F-14s basically flew right by them. So they're chasing them down. And, uh, and then that's why they started speeding up. And, and I thought they were speeding up to, you know, to end turn us with the GCI and whatever. And uh, they just never, they didn't know that we were there. So uh, it's kind of crazy but that's 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 how fluid and how wild things can be as we so we don't sit around in that merge uh they explode they didn't have a lot of gas in them it's more of a sparkle than a you know it's not like a, a big fireball uh and again we're not really looking at them we're looking past them because when you're flying the eagle you look for threats behind uh your adversary because there's always someone there that's going to spank you if you you know do circles and look around so we just blow through and we are going very fast and very low, and that's not where you want to be in an eagle. Uh, and, you know, you, we, we've just been through a lot in a very short period of time, but we don't have that 19,000 pounds of gas that we wanted because we just, and our wing tanks were down much lower. So, and we're, what I see immediately is the sand starts getting green. Well, green means rivers, and that means we're getting close to the target area. I don't want to fly through the target area. And let everyone know so i can't continue the route so i do something really dumb and tell everyone i go in in place immelman go and so we take that 600 knot plus knots and i take it straight up to whatever altitude get maybe i don't know 25 30 25 thousand feet but halfway up um I realize we're in the baghdad mez and i immediately get locked up i think because i'm first up and I said, you know, one's mud, nine o'clock, and I can see the range, and I can see the missiles coming up. And uh, and it's crazy. Again, I hear two clean, three clean, four clean, which is just not my day. But that's what you get for going up, being the first one up, I guess. Um, anyway, the missiles, uh, yeah, I could see them coming. They were SA-2s and 3s. Um, I don't think there were any 6s in this. There were at least three missiles. And uh, these uh, came at us, they were trying to pull lead. You could see them, the, uh, I could see them, the light off and then the uh, uh, sustained phase and it's going out in front of you. So at 20,000 feet, just again, or 25,000 feet, I jettison my center tank and, uh, and then start uh, just trying to outmaneuver the missiles, which was not difficult at all. SA-2s are not uh, highly maneuverable uh, missile. Still enough to get your attention though, if you're not doing anything, um, the weird thing about that is, uh, when I jettisoned my, uh, centerline tank and I'm fighting, uh, what I think are three missiles coming at it, at me, cause I'm still locked up and I can see it on the raw. Um, my fuel gauge goes to bingo. Then it says fuel low and my fuel gauges are reading zero all the time. I'm doing these orthogonal breaks, uh, breaks and going back down to an altitude to defeat the threat. It doesn't make any sense to me because the motors are still running. So uh, after we got past the SAMs uh, and slowly climbing back up, um, uh, heading south, uh, um, I, I asked for a bow damage check from my wingman because you never know. I mean, I don't know what's happening. Maybe I am leaking fuel or something. Bottom line, the, the, the uh, centerline tank fueled out, uh, shorted out the fuel gauges. They just went to zero. I'll tell you that after we show, but so if I digress a little bit, the comm was so good and so quiet uh, through this engagement. The only break in comm discipline is after I, I called splash two, hoser called splash two, because we, we did hit two megs, we called splash two, splash two. And someone in the F-16 said shit hot. Uh, and that was the only comm that you heard the whole bloody time. Uh, and, but it was kind of funny. We had really good calm discipline. We worked our way past the SAMs on the way home. Uh, uh, hit a tanker because we were all low on gas. Reported that we had um, the ordinance that we had uh, deployed. So when we came, we had a long ride home. And Hoser, um, number three, is a great guy. He goes, Sly, we got to do an air show for, got to do an air show, got to do an air show. And I go, 
man, I'm just happy to be out of here. I don't want to do an air show. Um, let's just land. Uh, we had a great, you know, great mission. So hosers ride me like a rented mule all the way back to Tabuk. So I go, okay, we're going to do an air show. So we come in uh, uh, in combat spread with our wingmen uh, going very fast and we break uh, and we're clean. I'm clean. I'm a clean Eagle now with a couple missiles missing. So it's a very impressive airplane clean. And uh, we come in the overhead break 550 or something, whatever. Um, and we drop off number two. Uh, and when we come to the break, I can see a huge crowd down. They say, hey, we want you to land on what we call center stage. And uh, I go, Roger that. Come in the break, I look down, there's probably, I don't know, 150 guys down there. So gave a real nice break. And then the, uh, the air show part, um, I, I came back around after we kissed uh, two, two lands. And I, you know, I, I do a, uh, basically a low transition. Uh, I come around, uh, raise the gear, full blower, go right by the troops, yank back as hard as I can on the stick and do an aileron roll at a hundred feet or something. Uh, I guess there's, there was some dust flying I heard. And uh, unbelievably uh, upside down, looking at the troops and I get a master caution light and I go, damn, I'm going to crash right here in front of all these guys. And I rolled out basically, uh, it was a very aggressive uh, uh, aileron roll and then pitched out and, and uh, landed. And uh, Hoser, I think did one that was better than mine, I heard. <laughs> Um, the wing commander was very upset and, and wanted to ground us. But when we pulled into center stage, the troops were going crazy. And it was a great, um, it was very rewarding for the troops who had uh, kept those airplanes running perfectly. We had no ordnance malfunctions our entire time there. And uh, the troops were just ecstatic. I mean, the airplanes were always working. Uh, the radars always worked and our missiles worked. So they, the troops were really, really happy. Uh, the wing commander said if there's any more kills, uh, the, the airline rolls will be done about 1,500 feet. And uh, we uh, gave a handshake to each other, and a couple of boys went back to get a crew rest. I went to Intel uh, to get ready to, uh, to debrief and then to get ready for the next mission, which was in about uh, four hours. And then, uh, uh, oh, in between that, my wife had our first child. So I ended up talking to my wife uh, through the Red Cross, uh, and then we went back and flew another, uh, you know, led another mission uh, later that day. So that was day one uh, for me. I know that was lengthy, and I'm sorry. It's no, don't, absolutely nothing to apologize for. It was it was wonderful to listen to you talk to that. Um, I, I suppose the obvious question that I would ask then is, you know, in terms of mistakes made, um, uh, and your mm -hmm. You know the fighter pilots pray about you know God don't let me mess this up. Um, is it inevitable then that even if you get somebody who is um, you know good like you were, who has been through the schools, who's had the opportunity to fly a lot, um, that they'll go in to combat and those sorts of um, things like you know asking for an in-place orman in the middle of the the Baghdad supermez, those sorts of things will happen. I mean, is that do you have to just be philosophical about that? You just can't iron out all the wrinkles. No, you can't, you know, it's, and that's the quality of the training. If you just think how many other mistakes could be made if you weren't as good as you were. Mm. And so the in-place element really was, be, it was just outside of the mez. I knew where I was. I didn't think they'd reach out and get me, but they did. All right. So that's a lesson learned. But, you know, if I, you know, the, when you're, you, you don't have a lot of time. I mean, I'm certainly as a former strike fighter guy, I'm not going to fly over the target and warn everybody that someone's coming because they had no clue. And, uh, you know, the, and 40 airplanes are about to rain, you know, some serious damage on that place. So my other only other option was uh, I can't continue the route. So I can stay low and just turn around and go back right at the strike package, which they just heard of a shoot down. Are they going to shoot at me? No, they're, you know, there's F-15s back there with them, escorting with them, close escort. And they've just, everyone's on this radio frequency. So if I just turn around and head straight south towards where the strike pad is coming, I didn't see that as a viable option. So I didn't have a lot of time to think on that. So the pitch up, 
Was that something I'd do again? I don't know. Um, uh, you know, but that's the only option I thought I could see for us at that time. Because going straight, low on fuel, and you weren't going to get gas. You're a couple hundred miles north of the border. What, what are you going to do? You're going to run out of gas. So um, it was the only thing I could think of at the time. But uh, yeah, was it brilliant? I don't think so. I, I um, but uh, I got us into it, and we got and I got us. You know, got we got out of it. But uh, I think things like not having a tanker, having a lead nose when you having your alternate mission commander's radar doesn't work, or you, I mean, do you just what do you do? Do you put four and threes place and three just hang on? Are you going to take a guy into combat with a partially good airplane? Mm. You know, those are decisions that um, they're not, they're easy to make. Or oh, it's just like getting a tanker. Hey, there's go take that other tanker. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, we're combat rules apply, I guess, is the way you say it is now you're not asking for permission. You're doing things and you're, you're not really used to doing that when you're in garrison or in training. So that first mission is, I guess you've always heard, I've always read that first mission is the most important one. After that, you know, these, these elaborate maps and planning, it was pretty simple. I mean, same way, same days, air superiority, here we go. And uh, so, you know, you just get through that first one you did get yourself in trouble at times and get lots of missiles shot at you. And that was always odd that the Eagles were always out in front without um, great capability to defeat the threat. I would have liked to have weasels with me or an EF-111, you know, out with me because uh, it seemed like we were sand magnets at times leading some of these missions. Um, and I think that's a lesson we learned. We all learned and we did learn how to defeat service air missiles and uh that that was um that was hard at times um i mean i had missiles coming in one night from the front and from the back at one time uh at talil leading 24 f-111s in at night and uh one of them almost got my wingman so that's a, a di different story for a different time but it's um you, you did that you did get yourself in areas that you didn't want to be but you still had to do your mission did you i mean do, do you ever contemplate the the fate of those two mig-29 pilots and um is there some um you know is there any sort of sympathy for them the fact that they were obviously quite badly let down by their uh, their gci controllers i mean if you were up up in the 30s coming in in the contrails and you were ramping down for all these miles, you know, with AMAX right. giving you the the the, the, the you know, permission to engage, somebody should have seen you. Well, I think that's the the, the whole idea was with you know several hours before uh, the F one seventeens took out all their long basically their communications and long range radars. I think that what they were left with was short close in like GCI radars, 30 miles out, uh, they could detect something. So they were basically, our effectiveness uh, at those first strikes at 3 a.m. for the next several hours were so effective uh, that they were pretty much blind, mm. flying blind. And I think I'm just guessing that they were sent out to protect an area and uh, they just didn't have a clue. And yeah, I feel terrible for those guys. And, uh, I don't know if they got out or not. I heard someone got out. I don't know. I don't see how that's possible. Um, yeah, that, that, that weighs on you. No one's no, there's no joy. And it, it's not, I mean, it's just, you did your job. I mean, uh, it's nothing. Uh, there, there were no, no real high fives or anything. It was just, okay. We did, we, we survived and now we go do it again. You mentioned, I think it was offline. I don't think it, we were recording, and this was the last time we talked at the end, or or maybe it was a different time and we talked. I don't know. But so you said that second mission, then that you flew a few hours later. Uh, I think it's the second mission. You said you were discussing those RAF tornadoes. Um, that had a slightly different outcome. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, it was a, I think, a midnight TOT, and 
our job was just to go out in front of, uh, they were carrying the runway destruction device uh, and that airplane with that package is limited to a certain altitude to be effective, uh, to, de to deploy that ordinance effectively, basically to destroy some runways out at H2, H3, which was Western Iraq. Um, and uh, we, we just went out as a pure BVR sweep in front of them. Uh, at the altitude they were flying, uh, they met uh, extraordinary AAA. I mean, you could see it as we uh, went past the target area, and we did go over the target area at altitude, um, looking or near the target area. You could look down and just see as they were going an extraordinary amount of AAA. I mean, it looked it's like the Fourth of July. Um, if you if you can do it that way, and then if you know that what you the tracers you're seeing is every fifth round. So, you know, it's just a wall of steel. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, we did hear an ELT go off, emergency locator transmitter. Uh, I know one, I'm certain one tornado went down. I don't know if two went down. I can't recall. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the details on that. Um, but it was not a great mission. It wasn't, it showed um, some some limitations that we needed to t that we needed to fix, mm -hmm. and I think the tornadoes figured that out a little bit stodgy at first. And no offense, uh, because they had a mission to fly, um, but we needed we needed to take out that AAA and those surface to air threats a little bit better before they could get in there and get those runways because um, they they took a beating. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, and I think if you um, if you've ever interviewed some of those guys that did that. Uh, pretty gutsy. I mean, extraordinary pilots. So during Desert Shield, they would ask us to fly in their back seat, and I come out of chance. <laughs> These guys are nuts. They, because um, yeah, we'd fight against them and watch them fly, and they were uh, very comfortable uh, below fifty feet and five hundred and forty knots. So they're excellent aviators. Um, that was a very very tough mission, and that night did not go well for them. Um, but I, um, that's that's all I know about that. What were your uh, main takeaways then from, because I think you flew 48 missions in uh, Desert Storm, something yeah. like that. What were your main takeaways then as to you know, things that you you came back and learned or things that you want to have changed, whether that was a technology or tactics or you know integration, whatever? Wow. Um, I, I Honestly, the game plan was so superior and our forces were so aggressive. It was unbelievable to watch. And I think, it, yeah, 48 or 50 missions, who cares? Um, I think it was 50. I don't know where 48 came from, but it, that, that doesn't matter. Um, but um, everyone was different, but everyone, as you went one more, uh, you got more comfortable. You were, uh, more comfortable working in an isolated environment. You were more comfortable making your own decisions. Uh, you were so far away sometimes that, you know, you're so far north of Baghdad that when you were chasing the guys running to Iran, um, you know, you didn't need permission or someone to tell you to shoot. Uh, and we had guys that did that. And, you know, we had guys, you know, basically lock them up and they ran into the ground. Um, uh, so you, you learned some things to do. You could do things. You just did things without, you had more autonomy, uh, uh, flying, which I think, uh, and that comes with a certain comfort level as you fly more missions. But the first, the first couple of days were pretty, um, they were pretty, they were pretty intense. After that, it was really pretty easy. Um, they, uh, they essentially stopped flying, but our, our overall game plan and the absolute destruction, I can only imagine if you've been on the ground and heard a 500 pounder go off, um, uh, that's the concussion is enough. The frag pattern goes out 3000 feet. So, uh, imagine, you know, 2000 pound bombs being dropped on you for 30 days straight, 24 hours a day. I mean, that, uh, that game plan was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. You talk about softening up a target before uh, ground forces go in. It was, uh, and then that that component with the ground was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And the 
interaction between ground and air was fantastic. Um, you didn't, I, I did roll in on some guys. We did learn how to strafe and we did get grounded for strafing or I didn't, but some people did. Um, as to the airplane had a, a gun in it and you could shoot stuff with it. And, um, I don't know, Rick Delaney didn't talk about it, but he, they, they went up North and strafed to some candids and stuff. Uh, you know, but they got a lot of stuff shot at them too. And you could have, you know, we're going to lose an Eagle, uh, for strafing uh, stuff on the ground, but sometimes we did some things like that. Were you, did you have sort of half an eye on your Marine brothers then? Uh, because I think uh, Manfred was, you know, he, he led, the, you, you wish you did a correction and I put it on the, the video, the, the biggest Marine air group, um, uh, during, yeah. during that war. Um, any distraction around, you know, sort of wondering what, what was going on with those guys or hearing about, because they, they took a, you know, they, they took some losses, didn't they? Well, the AB8 did, um, for sure. Uh, tough mission, single engine. You know, we had some Hornets hit um, by SA-7s, I think, and uh, they came home. Uh, we... I really didn't have much contact with the Marines. Uh, they were so far east, and our AOR was essentially Western Central Iraq, and I think there was just mostly Eastern Iraq. We never really overlapped. We did overlap with the Navy on occasion. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and that first engagement, we should have seen those Tomcats. Our wingmen weren't really doing their job as well as they should have, because we probably should have seen those Tomcats, um, because they saw us visually, and they saw the missiles come off, which to me, uh, told me we weren't doing our job as well as we could have. Yeah. We should have known they were there. And presumably uh, they, they, were, they, they were high because you said you were low. No, they were low. They were below oh, us. They were, oh, yeah. what? They were below They were down low, low, running out. Yeah. Um, because the Rio told me he saw the missiles. He saw two missiles come off the air. He saw one come off of one airplane, and two come off the other. And uh, they were, had uh, MiG 29s at their six as they were running out. Oh, really? um, so, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Probably not a good place for a Tomcat either, if, if no. they'll admit it. I, uh, I thought the Tomcats had been told they couldn't do do anything over land. I thought the, the idea. I think that was after day one. That was after day one, was it? This was, yeah, I'm thinking that was uh, later. They, uh, an airplane not optimized for uh, no. use over land. No. Everyone knows that. They knew it too. I, I think they also lacked that. I mean, you, you, you've been. Uh, cautious about talking about the ROE and, and identification capabilities, but I think they also lack the ability. I think my understanding is you had to have two independent methods of identification if you were just going to self-authorize or whatever you call it to shoot somebody, and they they didn't have the ability to do that. So right. there's some right. sort of limitations there. Right. So so um, I, I think probably you know last 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 question for me then, slide just to, to wrap things up. Um, so when you got back stateside then after this experience um what, what did you do what what um i mean what can you do having come back from a um a conflict where i suppose you've done what you were trained to do you've proved that you could do it you've um taken out uh, a mig-29 where, where did you where did you go from there well I'm, well uh yeah i yeah, that was a tough one. So came home and we stayed in the squadron for a while, which was really uh, neat because we were so, everyone wanted to fight us now because we were now combat veterans. So those who didn't get to fight us, we, I, I was still in that squadron probably for five more months. I ended up going to the wing to be a stand of eval, uh, took a stand of eval position uh, to let the next Marine come in and to allow someone to take my position as a flight commander. I went to the wing to do wing stand of eval, So I flew with all three squadrons. So I think it's uh, anyone that's a combat veteran, somebody wants to fight against, they want to go, Hey, you were just there. I want to, I want to, I want to gun you or I want to fight you. So, um, we were very busy. Uh, a lot of people were riding a wave and they were on a tour of a uh, talking tour, uh, Um, and I attribute that to uh, uh, great leadership uh, by our CO who, and I say this to, you know, your window as a, a great fighter pilot, I think is very limited in time because once you become an 05, uh, you're more worried about troops and, you know, squadron activities. So you don't fly as much. You would, uh, our squadron commander allowed uh, us, the, the, the guys that were current lead these missions 
And that is a huge, um, it's not a, it's a huge gut check for any fighter pilot to say, you know, you boys take us into combat, but that's the boys that did it were the guys with tons of time and were weapons officers and were current and have very, you know, a lot of flying time, not just flying a couple times a month because as you know, so that leadership skill doesn't come easy for many. And I attribute that to Bill Teal for allowing us to do that. Also, uh, Rick Clouseau would not turn down a mission. So we had more missions, but uh, what any, than anyone, he was, uh, he was constantly on the phone asking for more missions. And so we flew our tails off. And so, I mean, I flew 135 hours in February, over 100 hours in January, and the thing started on the 17th. So in 14 days, 100 hours. I mean, we were flying twice a day, every day. Um, and so, you know, that um, was that was uh, that that was uh, fantastic. So uh, getting back stateside, flying for a few months, looking at I was looking at um, I've been flying for so many years. They said, well, we're going to um, either going to go do a ground tour or we can maybe make you an opso on a, a squadron that's going aboard the ship. And uh, that's where I uh, had a life, not life changing. Uh, my wife uh, for, uh, now almost 40 years had asked back then, will you, who had the, uh, our child on the first day um, of the, of the war. And I came home to a five month old daughter. She said, would you consider doing something else, which I never would have. Uh, and it was the hardest decision of my life was to, uh, uh, leave active duty and go in the reserves. And I figured I could still go in the reserves, you know, be a squadron command. I have a great time and still, you know, do what I love to do and still keep my wife and child, still keep my family. It wasn't one of those ultimatums, but it was essentially, please truly consider this. And it was a very, very, it was to this day, hardest decision I've ever made was to leave. Uh, got in the reserves and uh, I, I uh, had a uh, injury to my neck that uh, the Naval Aviation Medical Institute would not allow me to fly. Uh, ejection seat aircraft anymore because my neck was so damaged. So I uh, ended up uh, just doing shoe clerk work the rest of my reserve career uh, and became an airline pilot. So very, very difficult. Uh, it's something that I love to do, that I lived and breathed for, um, but I made that change. That was difficult for all of us, but I'm still married. So that, that's a bonus. Do you fly still now? I know you're retired from the airlines, but you've got a private pilot's license. Do you do, do any sort of... Yeah, if it doesn't have afterburner, I'm not interested. Really, I'm done. Well, all, all my friends have these airplanes. They're flying around. I just, no. Oh. I'll ride on the company plane. But you do uh, go and talk to Top Gun still. You've got a connection there still. And um, you, yeah. uh, you, um, you know, from talking to you offline, I know you go and do other other things where you, you know, go and help today's fast jet aviators to um sort of learn from some of your experiences that must make it more difficult actually to go it, it's actually you know i i remember going through top gun and willie driscoll came and talked to us and and then uh, some really old guy came and talked to us and you go man look at that old timer you know and they always said i wish i was in your you know you always they look out and go man i wish i was your age and doing this again so i've always been cautious never to say that to the top gun kids because uh, they are kids uh, i'm 65 years old they're 30 years younger at least uh, so um but it is interesting there are some of the same dynamics there's some of the same issues and what i usually talk about with them uh, are definitely not tactics it is all those intangibles the um uh, the things you can't be ready for the emotions the compartmentalization you will you know you will be surprised it will be noisy uh, you, it won't be some antiseptic, anti, you know, very quiet environment. So these are things you need to be thinking of that you don't normally see. So I no, I love talking. They have a million questions and um, I really share with them. I always talk about buffoonery, you know, things that you, you just did 
that were dumb. Um, because not not everyone, Steve Canyon, you know, out there flying a perfect flight every time. I mean, the reason we train so hard is that you can make mistakes and survive. I, I was picked up on this, this the other day for saying it's my last question and then asking other questions. But this is my last question then, Sly. So I didn't ask you about your call sign. Where does it come from? Uh, um, <laughs> I got that. Honestly, I got that in every uh, when I was flying. Um, at VFA 125 uh, in the rag. Um, and I, you know, it was crazy. I, I, uh, I just told the instructor we were doing uh, BFM 1v1 and I'd hurt my neck. I've always had neck issues um, for some reason. And I just said, hey, you know, this guy is Dave Lyons. It's called Simon's Lion. It's a commander. And he took me out. We did a 1v1. I said, I'm just going to tell you my neck hurts pretty bad. So, might need to take it easy today but you know we're going to do the mission i'm going to fly because i want to get out of there and get in the fleet well my neck really didn't hurt that bad and uh i had a pretty good day against him and he goes you know you're a sly son of a bitch and and he goes and the and he said it in the ready room and he goes your new call sign is sly it was actually sly dog uh and then we did they just got rid of the dog ended up being sly so it was nothing nasty or anything that you know it was just um i you know randy cunningham said it again you know and i quote him a lot if you're not cheating you're not trying and what that means is you basically do anything to win and you know if, if i have to you know i say hey my neck really hurts and then it really doesn't hurt that bad um you know that's that's kind of you know i guess that's where i got that or that that is exactly where i got it and it stayed with me well, Sly, you've uh, given us a lot of your time. It's really been interesting listening to you uh, mm. talk about your experiences as a Marine fighter pilot and then to talk us through your experiences on the exchange tour with the F-15 guys. So thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure having you and um, enjoy the rest of whatever it is you do in your retirement. Thank you, Steve. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I hope uh, some of that made some sense. Thanks for tuning in to 10 Percent True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.